The satisfaction I got from walking into Foils on Charing Cross Road and seeing two new Korean novels, both in hardback and both the exact same size and length. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> no, but it really was ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, so let's talk about these ooh books. What I have here are Walking Practice by Dolky Min. This is a brand new piece of experimental Korean fiction translated from Korean into English by Victoria Cordell. And a book that probably doesn't need any introduction, Greek Lessons by Hung Kung. If you know anything about Korean literature, you know that Hung Kung is kind of the contemporary darling of Korean fiction. Maybe she shares that title with Kyung Suk Shin. Both of them are very beloved. It's pretty likely that a lot of you watching this have read something by Hong Kong, most likely The Vegetarian or Human Acts. Her book, The White Book, I thought was absolutely exquisite and not enough people read it, but I'll get to that. I'm gonna talk about this first. And while I'm not here to compare these two books, they have nothing in common. I will say that I read them back to back and I did prefer this one because it personally spoke to me in a lot of really important ways. So what is it? Walking Practice is, as I said, a piece of short, experimental, contemporary Korean fiction. It tells the story of an alien. This alien crash-landed on Earth about 15 years ago. They escaped their planet as it was invaded and attacked and blown up. And they ended up fleeing and they survived and now they're on Earth and they're still just trying to survive. They have no recognizable gender. They have a form that is absolutely ridiculous by our standards. Just lots of tentacles and legs and eyes and like every kind of genital and so many genitals. And that gets described at one point and the book is scattered with weird sketches of what they might roughly look like, like the one on the cover and it's just brilliant. So many teeth. But they have the ability to shapeshift. And so they have been surviving on Earth for 15 years by taking on the guise of a human man or woman. When they first got here, they ate anything they could get their hands on. Stuff that we would consider edible and stuff that we wouldn't, like tree bark and concrete. But eventually they realized that the tastiest, yummiest, most satisfying thing that they could eat on this planet is us. So. They downloaded Tinder. They got themselves on a dating app and they would lure prey in through messages and present themselves as a man or woman as is needed. And then they would go to the prey's house and they would have sex with them. They'd have some fun, they'd get some gratification and then they'd bite their head off like a mantis. Is it mantises that do that? I think, I think it is. I don't know, I'm not a science. At least I'm having fun. Where was I? Right, so they eat people. And they would bite the head off and go om nom 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 and then suck out all the blood and juices and then eat the rest. They carry a backpack everywhere they go and that's full of tools mostly for cleaning up. So they clean the crime scene and then they go back to their home which is their crashed spaceship turned into a house in a forest outside of the city. We don't know where exactly this is and it doesn't matter. And that's the rhythm of this book. We follow this protagonist as they disguise themselves first as a woman and then as a man and go and eat some people. Lure them in, send them messages, go to their place, have sex with them and eat them. But you notice very quickly that there are some very obvious themes around gender and sexuality and social expression, which I myself as a trans person found very satisfying. I should also point out that this book is quite funny in places. It's very tongue in cheek, it's very self-aware. In the first hunt that we see, our alien is presenting as a woman and has to climb 16 stories of an apartment building because the lift is broken. And they're slowly sort of melting and losing their shape and their form and becoming like jelly on the stairs and it's very funny. But you start to see this examination of gender very quickly. When they present as a woman, they arrive at the apartment of a guy and they have absolutely no problem with seducing this guy, luring him into a false sense of security, having sex with him, and then eating him. It goes real smooth. Then, when they do the exact same thing, they present as a man and they're on the hunt for a woman, they lure the woman in, they do all the same stuff, but when they're actually in the space with the woman having sex, the woman almost escapes. And it makes you think about how women, so often, especially straight women who have sex with men, are often on the defensive, 
are often ready for things to go wrong, are looking for an escape, are aware that abuse may come, that they may not be safe. And that's the reason this woman almost escapes, is because she half expects the man to be dangerous, to be a predator, to be an abuser. It's a really eye-opening moment, I guess, depending on who you are. It immediately makes you think about how men treat relationships, and dating especially, and how women treat dating. The man isn't worried about things going wrong. He feels completely calm, he feels completely at ease, and he gets killed and eaten as a result. The woman almost escapes because she already knows that things could go wrong. She is already prepared. She has an escape plan if necessary. Women have to take precautions when dating men. Men don't. It's obvious, but the book really makes you think about it. Then, as the book goes on, it begins to, for lack of a better phrase, humanize its protagonist. A character who lives alone and is lonely has been living on this planet for 15 years just trying to survive, and although they eat people out of necessity, I guess, they also want companionship. As far as they know, their home is gone and they are the only one left, and so this is their home now, and they do want companionship. They are constantly tempted to remain in a human form and actually fall in love and date someone and not eat them. And the sacrifices you have to make in order to do that are kind of depressing, and the book hones in on that in a really, really satisfying way. It makes you think about how you have to present yourself to the world. Specific social rules, specific aesthetics you need to put on. The way that our genders are masks. Whether you are a man or a woman, especially a heterosexual man or woman, there are certain things you need to do in order to make yourself appealing. Not just in a sexual or romantic way, but also in a platonic and generally social way. There are things we need to do, there are ways we need to present ourselves, and the book goes into that. You've got a shape-shifting alien that has picked and chosen through study and trial and error the best ways to present themselves as a man or a woman. What aesthetics will help them succeed in the dating world best? How they must pass socially and aesthetically as a man or a woman. It's really, really interesting stuff. As a trans woman, I find this really painfully alluring, something that I think about an awful lot. Every time I step out my front door, I'm thinking about passing, all the time. I'm not even an HRT yet, and I have to constantly think about passing. Speaking just for myself, I quite often find that, these days at least, I pass pretty well because of my wardrobe and my long hair and my makeup, and the fact that I have generally soft features, and I'm very, very lucky to have those. I look like my mum. That's probably because the blood tests show that I am chock full of estrogen. I have so much estrogen in me, and I'm really grateful for that. But then I open my mouth, and I often see people's faces change a little bit. They hear my more masculine voice, and you just see a little change in their face. It's a little twitch, where they go, Ooh, Oh, oh, I did, hmm, huh. <laughs> what's going through their mind, right? This book had me think about that even more, and especially when it comes to cisgender people, especially when it comes to cisgender women who have to conform to certain societal standards in order to succeed in a social way and even a professional way. They need to be a certain size, they need to be a certain height, they need to be a certain weight, and that's just scratching the surface. This book really makes you think about how we need to present ourselves in order to fit in and succeed in all different avenues of social life as humans. It's painful, but satisfying and funny, and I think the fact that there is humour and a lot of gross killing and eating, I think that helps alleviate some of the thematic weight and pressure that this book puts on you. I loved it to bits though, I really, really did. As I already said, Hong Kong is an absolute legend of Korean fiction. She is so beloved. The Vegetarian, which was translated by Deborah Smith, who is also the founder of Tilted Axis Press. That book won the International Booker Prize in 2016. Everyone read it, everyone loved it, rightly so. It was the first Korean novel I ever read. And then I, like many, many other people, read Human Acts, which is set during the Korean War and is a really, really harrowing book. Then I read The White Book, which was also translated by Deborah, and it was absolutely wonderful. I did a written review of it way back when, like right when Books and Bow first started and all my reviews were written. I loved that book because it seemed to transcend fiction and narratives in a really satisfying way. It's full of photographs, the white pages, 
themselves are thematically part of the book. The White Book is experimental, but it doesn't come across as obnoxious or pretentious at all, and I was really impressed by that. Now we have Greek Lessons. This is a 150-page novel translated by both Deborah Smith and Emily Ye Won, and it's the story of two people, a man and a woman. The man is Korean, but grew up in Germany, and so feels kind of culturally confused. He also knows that he's going blind. He's known about going steadily blind for a long time, and he's struggling with that. He's struggling with his culture, with his memories, with his regrets. And the woman, who I found a more interesting character, is an academic, she's a writer, she's written for magazines, she's written books, I think. She's an academic in the world of literature. She's hugely successful, but she has recently become mute, and she struggled with mutism when she was a child as well, but her mutism has returned because she has just lost her mother to a battle with cancer, she's gone through a divorce, and she's lost the custody battle for her child. She's gone through so much trauma in such a short space of time that her mutism has sunk back in. And now she has basically decided to study ancient Greek and go to Greek classes as a way to reconnect with both language itself and with herself. The first thing that I really want to talk about before I forget is something I found so interesting with the way that this story is written. First off, we go back and forth between our protagonist's perspectives, they kind of take turns chapter to chapter, but the man's chapters are written in the first person. We are inside his mind. The woman's are written in the third person, and immediately the point of that is very clear and very effective. The man is lost in his mind. He's constantly thinking about himself, about his memories, about his culture, about his past. He is having a consistent existential crisis. He is, as we would say, up in his head. He is buried in his own thoughts, in his own memories. He is not present, he doesn't see the world around him. And so the first person perspective is claustrophobic. It is clogged up and messy, and you feel like you're in a hoarder's nest. The woman's narrative is written in the third person because she feels detached from herself. She is separate from herself. She doesn't remember who she is. She has lost touch with her family, she has lost her mother, and she has lost her ability to speak. And bear in mind, her job is all about literature. Therefore, it's about language, it's about communication. It's about stories and narratives and the things people tell each other, and she's lost her voice. And so she feels disconnected. And so the third person perspective puts her at arm's length from the reader. We feel a distance. As I read this, I felt like I was in the man's head. I was too close to him and it was uncomfortable. And the woman was far away and I was looking at her through like a telescope or as if she was at the end of a corridor and I could barely see her. It's literally how you feel as you read this. And that's something that I love about Hong Kong's books, is there is an incredible viscerality, if that's a word, visceralness, visceral quality to her books. You feel uncomfortably connected to the story in exactly the ways that Hong Kong wants you to, and that comes across beautifully in the translation. The fact that this is a book about Greek is obviously done on purpose as well, because Greek is a foundational language in Europe. I don't know that much about etymology, and about the roots of languages, even though I do find it all really, really interesting and I think about it a lot, I'm certainly not an expert at all. But you don't need to be. Thematically, you understand why Greek is chosen here. I should also mention that the man is in fact the woman's teacher of Greek. The fact that she is studying Greek feels so important because it's giving her a new avenue to explore language and human connection. But she could have done that with any language, she chose ancient Greek, as if she is going back to where language began, as if she's going back to basics, the building blocks of language. And it's very poignant and beautiful. The whole book is poignant and beautiful. It really has you thinking about language and what it does for us, and the ways in which we use it, and the ways in which we use it without even thinking. It has you feel a heightened awareness of words, of communication, and also even non-verbal communication and written communication, the differences between fiction and non-fiction in writing, audiobooks, so many things. This is a staggeringly thought-provoking and yet incredibly and excessively human novel. I also want to go back to this really quickly because I forgot and I feel terrible for forgetting just how wonderful Victoria Cordell's translation is here. She has done an incredible job 
uh, translating something that must have been so difficult to translate. This is written in a very strange and experimental way, literally on the page. As far as I understand, because I can read Hangul, I don't know any Korean, but I can read the Korean alphabet. Hangul is written in this beautiful building block kind of a way. And as far as I understand, in the original Korean, those blocks are sort of opened up and spread out in pieces along the page at certain points, and that's really, really cool. And so Cordell had to find a way to do that in English, to translate that feeling and tone and visual style on the page, and I think she did an incredible job at that. And she also did a brilliant job of making this book incredibly funny in English, and very visceral on a sexual and horror level. There's a lot of creative swearing, creative sexual language, and creative abusive language in here that I was really, really impressed by. Her translation is staggering. I also wanted to just read out a bit from, suitably, page 69, that really got me thinking about how monsters are created socially. How especially straight white men, conservatives, politicians, the media, how they create monsters almost out of a necessity to scapegoat people. And that is expressed here where it says, People are busy avoiding me up close and pointing at me from afar. My gait has quickly become the object of ridicule and horror. Am I wrong? It would be great if I was. I understand their hearts a hundred, a thousand times over. For them, life is so boring that if someone doesn't walk with ease, taking steady steps on two healthy legs of the same length, they violently overreact as if they were waiting for it. I think their bar for reactions is pretty low. They can't wait to ogle a monster. Without monsters, how would they withstand the unrelenting futility of their days? That's absolutely amazing in writing and translation. I loved both of these books so, so much. Absolutely brilliant. Korean fiction in translation is offering us some of the best literature in the world right now, and I am so thankful for it. Without Korean fiction in translation, without the works of Han Kang, books in Bao wouldn't exist, and I'm very, very, very grateful. If you enjoyed this, feel free to support me on Patreon. I always, always welcome new patrons, and I could really do with them, because YouTube ad revenue is dog shit, and I love doing what I do. And I think I'm good at it. <laughs> so support me on Patreon if you like, and as always, subscribe for books.